Today we're in High, Texas at the William Chris Vineyards, a special place with some very passionate people who will take you on a journey of wine, from the grapes off the vine to a delicious treat in your glass. It's time to hit the road and discover Texas with Wesley Willis. Get ready to travel deep into the heart of the Lone Star State, meeting friendly folks and exploring fascinating places. Experience a way of life like nowhere else in the world as we uncover the rich history and culture of Texas. Discover adventure. Discover excitement. Discover Texas with Wesley Willis. As the sun rises over the green rolling hills, its golden light spills through the canopy of leaves, revealing grapes on the vine, marking the start of the August harvest. Though these images might bring to mind faraway Tuscany or the verdant Napa Valley, they're becoming more and more familiar in the heart of Texas hill country. The Lone Star State is gathering a lot of attention, not only for its scenic views, but for wines that are taking the industry by storm. And nowhere is this more apparent than in high Texas. Just an hour from both Austin and San Antonio, and just down the road from Fredericksburg, this hidden gem of a town is home to William Chris Vineyards. Established by Bill Blackman and Chris Brundra in 2008, this winery uses old world and state of the art techniques to create wines that are an authentic expression of the fruit, the land, and the passion that are 100% Texas. My name is Bill Blackman, and I'm the owner of William Chris Vineyards. I'm one of the owners. <laughs> I'm Chris Brundra, co owner of uh, Wine Grower for William Chris. And I'll never forget, we're at this little swanky bar down the street from our house. He looked over and he goes, hey man, aren't you uh, that kid making that hot little Blanc de Bois everybody's talking about? I was like, yeah man, you're, you're Bill Blackman. We just talked and uh, had a cocktail. and he, uh, He's like, you like vodka? And I said, yeah, I, lo I like vodka, I love vodka. He goes, me too, let's have a martini. And He was very interested in wine as I was interested in wine. And talked about all the wonderful things about growing grapes in Texas and all the hardships and how we thought that if we had our own place, you know, we could really be growing grapes and making wine in a different way. He became a good friend and then became uh, my partner. You know, I'm just so blessed to be able to get to know that guy. I mean, he's been farming grapes in Texas for over 30 years. He actually coincidentally planted his first vineyard where I was born, so, you know, you can't compete with that kind of experience. Yeah, I started growing grapes in 1983 when we were, uh, our family was farming. Just tried to diversify the crop and planted a vineyard, and uh, I guess as they say, the rest is history. It's been a few years. We try not to think of it too much, <laughs> too often. Bill and Chris have created something very special here, and the people they brought together genuinely enjoy their work. I was fortunate enough to join them for their Morvedra harvest. So you know how that there's that show of worst jobs in America? This is not one of them. The morning was very peaceful and a lot of fun. I could easily spend the whole day here. But I wondered, what drives someone to make a life out of it? For answers, we turn to Lou Grissick, the tasting room manager, and Dee Thompson, director of wine education and experiences. These two men have a deep appreciation for wine, but it wasn't always that way. The first time I tried wine. I don't remember the first time I tasted wine. How old were you? <laughs> yeah, who knows? I mean, I tasted wine sometime when I was a kid. <laughs> I don't remember um, hating it. I didn't immediately take to it and get interested in it. My mom let me have a sip of probably like Franzia, you know, white Zinfandel, um, just to see what it was like. A little bit later on, I was in Austin. I was working at a restaurant on South Congress. I was just doing my job. Um, when I started to travel the world and uh, dine at some really nice places with some really incredible chefs. Before a shift, you know, generally the team will taste the special dish that the chef's prepared so that they can sell that and recommend that to the guests and create a better experience and then also if there is a sommelier on site if there's a manager a wine steward on site they will taste some wines that may be featured who had great sommeliers pairing wines with food and i think for me that 
I really started to enjoy and appreciate wine in its rightful place, which I think most of the time is with food um, at a meal. And so really understanding how food and wine uh, interact with one another um, and how we can treat wine like food and food um, can be an integral part of the wine experience, I think was when I really started to understand and appreciate it more. And I tasted a wine, it was a 1997 wine from the Amalfi Coast in Italy. And that is the wine that singularly changed it, turned me on my head. Dang. And uh, <laughs> I didn't know that it could happen that way. I didn't know, but what it brought out of me, it was, it was something that was really evocative of a memory and great feelings. And through the course of service that night, it kept evolving and it kind of wouldn't leave me alone. The more I traveled the world, the more I saw wine as a catalyst for bringing people together. Something that regardless of you know, your background or your political beliefs or what have you, you could all come together, share a meal, share a bottle of wine, and enjoy each other's company. Though Luke and Dee's love of wine has taken them all over the world, they both found themselves drawn to High Texas. They were eager to share the experience of the William Chris Vineyards and Winery. We started with Luke, who showed us around the grounds. Our first stop was the Oak Grove. I feel truly blessed and privileged to be able to take 12 years of experience in the world of wine in Napa Valley and Sonoma and apply it here. Here at William Chris Vineyards on our estate, you can come out and enjoy the entire cycle of the vine. You can enjoy the entire cycle of the production of the wine from the soil to the glass. So here you get to experience Texas wine, you get to see it, smell it, taste it, but you also have the ability to get kind of behind the scenes really quickly. We, you know, as a policy are happy to peel back the curtain and reveal Oz. We're a working production facility. So we grow Texas wine, we make Texas wine, we bottle Texas wine on this facility, and we want to share that. We want everyone to be a part of that experience. And is this your only location, or? This is our location for experiencing the wines, for presenting the wines. So this estate is a 20-acre property with a little over six acres under vine. We are growing at other locations in the hill country, and we're growing up in the high plains and other points in the state of Texas. But 100% of what we do is Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm from Texas. I spent the last 12 harvests in California, but I didn't know until I got here really how far this industry has come and what it has to present. I didn't expect that I would find wines of this quality. I didn't expect that I would find this physical beauty as far as the grounds and the estate itself. I didn't know that there were players of this kind of talent in the game here quite yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I've been blown away. I've worked with some iconic brands, large and small, family-owned, operated. I have a good deal of experience across. I have never worked with a team that is more talented or more passionate, more capable or more exciting than the one that I'm a part of now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. And do you find that other people are just as surprised to find a huge wine presence here in Texas? Yes. People are starting to take note. People are starting to make their way to Texas, um, which is now the number two wine destination in the country, wow. which is remarkable. I did not know that. So um, for us, you know, people from all walks of life and all experience levels come here and are surprised and delighted mm -hmm. with what's going on in Texas. Um, the quality, the character, the purity, of what we're presenting is something that we get to be there for. We get to present it. We get to share that aha moment saying, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Discovery is something that happens here all year round. At this point, the grapevines are on the way to shutting down, to going dormant, to going to sleep. And bless them, they've done the work. And they produced a really, really beautiful, bountiful, very balanced, great quality crop. So those leaves that are starting to get pretty, pretty fall colors will get more beautiful. And then the leaves will fall and we will simply have the naked dormant vines through the winter months. And our focus shifts in the winery from harvesting and processing wine, our focus will shift to blending, our focus will shift to bottling in that period of time. 
So there is always something to experience and enjoy here as far as the guest experience. Mm -hmm. So we have a dozen release parties a year when our members come out pick up their wine and for us to properly spoil them for their loyalty and support. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's all about. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for being a part of us and being a part of our story. At the release party, we'll have a station here for glass and bottle service and then the band sets up on that trailer. Nice. Yeah. It's a full production here. Just a few yards away is the William Chris Vineyards Pavilion. This combination of covered stage and wide open space is ideal for any celebration. This is a place just to gather, enjoy glasses, enjoy bottles. We will have live music in that opposite corner three days a week. The pairing of music and wine is something that is close to our hearts, mm -hmm. that we're very dedicated to, as well as food, so. Yeah, you can't go to a wine bar or a winery without there being some kind of music. Yeah. The newest addition to the estate is the High Society Tasting Room. This modern building made of steel and wood not only serves as a welcome center, but also as a hub for wine tastings, food and wine pairings, and educational experiences. Here, guests can spend a relaxing day with friends while letting one of the William Chris ambassadors guide you through a delightful array of styles and varietals. And if you like the way these wines taste, you'll love seeing how they're made. When we come back, we're gonna get a tour of the winery with Dee. So stay with us. Hold on to your hat. We'll be right back. The reason I was drawn to William Chris, I think, was kind of two parts. Um, one, I think for me as a born and raised Texan, somebody who cares a lot about our state being respected in the larger wine conversation globally, um, is the fact that Chris and Bill have been since the beginning dedicated to producing all of their wines uh, from 100% Texas grapes. And that for me, when you see Texas on a label, that you can actually believe that it means that 100% of our product was grown here and produced here. So I care about that because I want our state to be respected and I think it, in order for our wine to be respected, in order to support Texas farmers and the Texas wine industry, um, that I want to be a part of a company that's doing that. So it, it's, I think secondly, um, the wine's good. You know, I, <laughs> I've been able to travel to 35 plus countries the world over. I drink a lot of different styles of wine. Um, and I think the wines that we're making taste good and are a quality expression of where they're grown and how they're produced. When it comes to the harvest, weather and timing are key. The acidity, sugar content, and flavor profiles of the finished wine are heavily dependent on them. Once the grapes are harvested, turning them into a quality wine takes a lot of thought, skill, and time. That process begins here. So this is what's called our crush pad. The first step in the winemaking process is called crush. Crush is really just the opening up of the individual berries. So they'll come in here in these um, big bins that you see. Those bins will get pulled off of a truck and it gets processed out here on the crush pad. A lot of times we're going to put it through a destemmer and that makes sure to take the stems away from the berries, the individual berries. So the technical term for this is grape must. So they call it must at this point. The grapes are gonna go likely back in a bin or into a larger tank container. It just depends on one, the availability of the different uh, storage devices and two, what style of wine we're trying to make. Real key distinction in winemaking, right? For white wine, the skins generally do not sit with the juice during fermentation. Um, that's actually the key uh, difference in white wine making and red wine making is that the skins for re during red wine making the skins are going to sit on the juice during fermentation and that transfers all that color so you actually could make a white wine from red grapes if you didn't leave the skins on the juice these vessels are going through active fermentation right now oh my gosh you can like smell it immediately so you got to be careful when you pull it back not to stick your face in the bin uh, because it's producing carbon dioxide as a product of fermentation in addition to alcohol, right? So sugar processed by the yeast becomes alcohol and CO2, and that CO2 is odorless and it can kill you. So um, um, it, it can be dangerous, you gotta be careful. Um, but right now, we're looking into the bin, you can see the skins and the seeds and a little bit of the stems on top. 
you want to have this um, skin transfer all the color and the flavor and some of the, the texture and tannin into the juice itself. So during fermentation, the skins will stay with the juice. And well, how long are they sitting there for? Um, it depends on the style of wine you're making and, oh, okay. the, and varietal. So that, that's the other thing is like we work with so many different kinds of grapes, uh, making so many different styles of wine. For us, it really depends anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. For one particular wine, we might even do a certain percent short maceration or short skin contact. And we might do, uh, let's say like 30% of the lot. And then the other 70% we might do for extended maceration. And then we will blend the two together. And really you have to think about it almost like a spice cabinet in the kitchen with a chef. You're, or an artist with their color palette, right? You get all of these different components that when you make the final blend, even though it might be a single vineyard, single varietal wine, meaning it might be Sangiovese from the Clink Vineyard, um, we might have done four or five different components to make that one single vineyard, single varietal wine, um, but it allows the winemaking team to have blending components to make the perfect wine. And so some longer skin maceration, some might be uh, aged in concrete versus aged in stainless steel. Some might see new oak versus neutral oak during the aging process. Um, we might even use some of our, our fooders, um, which are these really large oak containers that you see upstairs in our barrel room. Um, and those different components all lend a different kind of flavor, a different kind of weight, uh, a different kind of aroma. And all of those different things, like a chef in a kitchen, need to go together perfectly for balance. And um, really, at the end of the day, the winemakers want it to express what that grape from that place during that year was meant to express. Right. OK. So, wow. So during fermentation, those skins will sit with the juice for red wine. And then after fermentation is done, then we'll actually put it through a press. Um, that's actually what this machine here is, is a press we're going to press the skins off of the juice. That is one of the key times that the winemaker has to make a really important decision. Have I allowed enough of what's in the skins to transfer into the juice? The color, the tannin, the aromas and flavors that really bring character to red wine. Because at the point at which you press the skins off of, of the juice, it's really hard to go backwards. I mean, like you're, you're basically getting rid of nature's device that gives wine a lot of its character away from the juice itself. Um, so it's a really important decision when you're ready to press. Once the grapes are pressed, the juice is sent back to the holding tanks. These are holding tanks. They've got a jacket on the tank and the jacket helps us regulate the temperature of the liquid inside the tank. And so we can have more control over the fermentation process. We can have more control over when fermentation is done what temperature the wine is stored at. What would be the, the difference between these versus the concrete? Or is there a certain reason you use the concrete over these? Absolutely, so you think about vessels in winemaking on a spectrum from reductive to oxidative. Reductive meaning reducing the amount of oxygen that interacts with the wine, both during fermentation and then again during aging. Oxidative meaning you encourage oxygen interaction potentially during fermentation and or during aging. Stainless steel is on the reductive end of the spectrum. Barrels are on the oxidative end of the spectrum. Concrete somewhere in the middle. It's a little bit closer to stainless steel. So when you are making wine in a reductive style, you are trying to maintain the freshness of the wine, the fruitiness, the aromatic qualities of the wine, but you're sat potentially sacrificing some of the texture and the body of the wine. Whereas on the oxidative end, it's kind of the opposite. You might be sacrificing a little bit of the freshness and aromatic profile, but you're able to add complexity through the additional oxygen that interacts, but then also potentially some of the character from the oak. We are on the lighter end of oak use, uh, meaning we don't use a lot of new oak. We think it can overpower the wine. And our, our style of winemaking is more reductive in general. So we are, generally speaking, trying to keep oxygen away from the wine during the winemaking process. Uh, we believe that, one, it helps us to share more of what the grape is trying to express, both from its variety, but then also from the vineyard it was grown in. Reductive winemaking also, depending on who you ask, 
um, is supposed to help the wine age better um, because it becomes a little more, they describe it as kind of closed off in its youth, but then it helps it age a little bit slower in the long run. After the press, they're going to get put into a vessel of some kind. That might just be a holding tank. So a lot of times after you press, you want to let the wine settle. Um, there's still small amounts of sediment in the wine, particles of grapes and, and whatnot. Um, so you might put it in a tank to let it settle. Um, and then you might rack that clear juice off of the settling at the bottom. Um, so racking is really just the movement of wine from one container to another, usually with the goal of removing some little bit of sediment. So you let it settle in a tank so all the solids will settle to the bottom, and then you run a hose out of the tank where it's just the clear juice at the top. And that hose runs to another container. By moving the wine from container to container, you're leaving a little bit of sediment each time you move it in the previous container, and then you can get rid of that sediment. So you're clarifying the wine in a more natural way. You have to be careful we don't want to rack as many times because we're introducing a lot of oxygen into the wine. Mm -hmm. And then so after the vessel and after the setting process or depending yeah. on the wine you're making, yep. is it going straight to the bottle or? Most of the time it's going to age. There's a lot of different options here. You can allow red wine to go through uh, malolactic conversion where malic acid turns into lactic acid. And we're getting really scientific and nerdy yeah. here. <laughs> um, but malic acid is really present in things like green apple. So think about the kind of tart green notes that you have. Um, when you convert malic acid into lactic acid, lactic acid is the acid that's in things with lactose, like milk. And it gives a creamier mouthfeel. So you're changing the texture of the wine. You're also changing the, the acid level because during malolactic conversion, um, you actually do lose a little bit of acidity. And so you're gonna change the balance of the chemical components of the wine, which will both potentially change the feel in the mouth, so the texture, the weight, and then the aromatic profile of the wine or the flavors that you're gonna taste in that wine, um, as well as you know, the chemical balance. Now, every once in a blue moon, you want a fresher, lighter, more fruit-driven red wine that is more light-bodied. You might want to prevent malolactic fermentation or malolactic conversion. Once malolactic's done, then you're really talking about how do we wanna age the wine? Do we wanna keep it in a large tank? Um, do we wanna put it in a smaller barrel? Uh, do we want to put it in concrete or do we want to break up the components in multiple different containers for the aging process? Most of the time for our wines, we're aging red wine before bottling anywhere between 16 and 22 months. Um, oh, wow. So you have to think like over a year before it's ever going to go into the bottle. Um, and again, a lot of that means sitting, waiting, and then tasting. So our winemaking team and our leadership team does a lot of work, uh, not during harvest, so not during this time of year, um, but other times of the year going through and tasting barrels and lots of wine to understand where they are in the process. When we return, we'll get to see the fruits of their labor. Stay tuned. Hold on to your hat, we'll be right back. Every bottle of wine at William Chris Vineyards is carefully crafted to express the best Texas has to offer. Dee and I returned to the tasting room where he showed me a few standouts. The 2017 Hunter from the Texas High Plains is probably our wine club's favorite wine. It is the only wine you'll ever see this red capsule on. So anytime our members see this released for the new year, people start leaving here with cases of it at a time um, just because it's such a good wine. Uh, this is more in the style of the right bank Bordeaux wines, which are mostly Merlot. So this is 76% Merlot, 24% Malbec. Um, which is another Bordeaux varietal. Um, really full-bodied, very rich fruited. You do get a very obvious oak profile on this, so you also get a little bit of baking spice, aromas, and flavors. I just tell people this is like what you want with your holiday roast. I mean, you want a, a big, delicious, well-spiced piece of meat, but this wine stands on its own just fine. It's a very approachable big red wine, not a punch you in the face red wine, but more a warm blanket in the winter kind of red wine. This is our 2018 Sparkling Rosé, our Petillant Naturel, or Pet Nat for short. We've been producing the Pet Nat style of sparkling wine since 2014. I believe we were the first in Texas to produce that style of wine. Pet Nat, or the ancestral method, is a winemaking technique that predates champagne. So it's an older 
sparkling wine production method than sh the champagne method is. Uh, it was created by monks back in the day on accident. Um, but we purposely bottle the wine before it's done fermenting uh, in the first fermentation and we put a crown cap on it. And what that does is the wine's gonna continue to ferment in the bottle giving off that carbon dioxide we talked about, but instead of the carbon dioxide being released into the air, it gets trapped inside the wine, creating the carbonation, creating the bubbles. Chris Brundret, one of our owners, likes to talk about this wine as a wine you have a relationship with, that we release it in late February, early March, while it's still got a pretty significant amount of residual sugar in it, um, but because um, it hasn't been filtered, it's gonna continue to ferment. And so when you first meet it, kind of like when you first meet a person, a lot of times it's much sweeter. And then over time, as you get to know them better, less and less sweet, a little more, and, a little more real. Um, and so eventually this will completely ferment out and it'll be a completely dry uh, sparkling rosé. Um, so it's changed pretty significantly since release even to today. And with that one, once it's been opened, uh -huh. is, how good does it last? You know I, mean? I mean, you need to drink this within like the first hour that you open it. Most sparkling wine you're gonna wanna consume pretty quickly. Yeah. Pairs really great with any berries, um, so thinking like in our food and wine pairing, we actually do uh, fresh seasonal berries like raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, tossed in lemon juice, and then drizzled with some creme fraiche. Also goes good with any kind of creamy desserts because the acid in the wine and the carbonation cut through the creaminess of so things like cheesecake. Honestly though, this needs to be your Thanksgiving wine. A lot of people don't realize that rosé is actually the best fit for what is a very diverse table. With a lot of different flavors, a lot of different styles of preparation, and rosé, should be the lead wine um, because it's so versatile. It can go with so many different things. Noted. Enchanté, um, Enchanté has a, a pretty significant history behind it. You know, in French uh, means nice to meet you. So this was the first wine that Bill or William and Chris ever made together. It is a Bordeaux blend, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Petit Bordeaux. Um, so very much in a left bank Bordeaux style. Chris and Bill wanted to make a wine together that commemorated them coming together as two separate winemakers in two separate places and to kick off the business and say, hey, this is our gift to the people that are gonna drink our wine. And so this is this the is very a, first wine they mm, did together. Exactly, so this is the 2017 vintage of that wine. Uh, it's a wine that we make every year. Um, also a cult favorite, similar to the Hunter for our wine club. So these two wines are really, really popular. Um, they're a little bit more full-bodied than a lot of our wines. Um, you know, this particular one, all the grapes are coming from the Texas Hill Country. Um, so it's unique in that the Hunter, um, the grapes are coming from the Texas High Plains and these are coming from the Texas Hill Country and really shows a, a fuller bodied wine that's age worthy, that does have um, some obvious oak character to it and is going to age really well. And what does this pair well with? So this, I'm going to go a little more traditional um, when you're thinking about um, bigger proteins, things like steak, things like your your holiday roast, your ham, but I wouldn't also be afraid to put some nice fruit-based drizzles on those things, the gastriques and the dipping sauces, And but you wanna stay on the darker berried side, so things with like blackberry and blueberry, um, black currant. It's also good, go good with a cheese platter. I always think red wine and cheese has been a pair for a very long time and we don't really need to mess with that. And so we arrive at the end of our story where all the different components and decisions come together to create a wide selection of styles and varietals for your enjoyment. The wine that was made here will be ready in two years. That's a perfect reason for me to come back. For a full list of what William Chris has to offer, visit their website at www.williamchriswines.com. We'll leave you now with the word from Dee. Hopefully you've been able to see the beauty of our property, the exciting things that are happening in our winemaking facility, our beautiful tasting rooms, and it's all great to look at on a screen, but until you're actually here, standing in the vineyard, drinking the wine in the place that it was grown, on the property where it was produced, you don't really get the full experience. And for us, we want to share a piece of our world with everybody. And so we really hope folks will take the time to come out to High Texas. We're about an hour from San Antonio, an hour from Austin, um, driving distance from really anywhere in the state um, to come experience our wine on our property so that we can share a piece of our world with them. A huge thank you to everybody here at the William Chris Vineyards for sharing a piece of their world with us. And if you're ever in High Texas, be sure to stop here at the William Chris Vineyards to experience everything they have to offer. 
I'm Wesley Willis, and you're watching Discover Texas. Thanks for watching. I hope you really enjoyed the show. And if you did, be sure to click the like button, share our content, and subscribe to our channel. And while you're at it, check out our Discover Texas Facebook page.